right by my side Making me feel low He brought up thoughts of hurt and pain When I had gone astray He wanted to discourage me As I walked along my way He said you're undeserving Cause I know where you've been I have a record of your life And you were bound by sin I know your darkest secrets That you would never tell What makes you think you don't deserve A place with me in hell Well I heard the old accuser And this was my reply I sure deserve to die My righteousness is filthy rags And my goodness is unclean There's only one thing I can say To what you said to me It's under the blood No praise is to your name I'm not what I my stain and sinful past and put new life within. No longer do I bear the mark that sin had brought my way. With happiness and peace of mind, praise God I now can say, it's under the blood. Praises to your name. I'm not what I used to be. My life has been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding him it's under the blood. I'm not shackled by sin. I'm going to have you turn to two different passages tonight. I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 13 um, and then keep your place there and then make your way to Luke chapter number 4. Actually, those are just going to be our reading passages and then we're going to preach from Matthew chapter number 1 and Matthew chapter number 2. Uh, I appreciate the Lord helping us tonight and um, I appreciate a... Um, I appreciate the Lord orchestrating things just exactly the way he knows the way it needs to be done. And only the Lord can take man's feebleness and God do something with it. And I'm grateful tonight for a God that we have, that we serve that's just like that. Once you find your place in Luke chapter number four, I'm going to invite you to stand. And um, I want to share this and I, I pray for me. Pray that the Lord would help me get, um, get out my lips the intent of my heart that I believe that God wants me to preach tonight. And I, I want to get out of his way and be used of the Lord tonight. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse number 14 of Luke chapter number 4, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Now, well, I'll get ahead of myself. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now listen to this. And he came to Nazareth 
where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, uh, that's, this is not our text, but can you imagine what it would have been like to be in that synagogue that day? Can you imagine for somebody to take, up, to, to, to take open a prophecy? By the way, a familiar prophecy that they were familiar with, they were used to hearing that, they were anticipating to come and he reads the prophecy, he closes the book there in awe because he spake never as a man had spoken before. He spake as one having authority, the Bible says. And he opens his mouth back again and said, by the way, what I just read has just been fulfilled today. Now I'm going to tell you, you talk about a service, that was a service. Now they rejected him, but they missed out on a good thing. But I want you to listen to, after Jesus made that statement, the Bible said, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And listen to their response. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? If you ever been in a crowd of people that you can look at and say, they just didn't get it. Let me tell you, that was this crowd. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this Joseph's kid? Is not this Joseph's son? You say, well, preacher, what is, what's the big deal about that? I mean, he lived with Joseph. All right, now, keep your, keep your mind in that. It's not this Joseph's son. And then go to Matthew chapter number 13. Over in Matthew chapter number 13, and let's get to... Let me get back to the verse. Go to verse number 54. That's where we want to go. The Bible said, And when he was coming to his own country. Now you see that? Remember before in Luke, in Luke chapter number 4, it told us he went back to Nazareth, right? Where he was brought up in Nazareth. All right, and when he was coming to his own country, he, saw, he taught them in the synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty words? So where did, where did this guy learn this? How did he learn to to speak like this? Now listen to this description. Is not this the carpenter's son? And so he said, is this not Joseph's son? And then they wouldn't even refer to him in other other portions. They just remembered saying, oh yeah, he's the son of a a carpenter. I want to to take that thought tonight and and those, those two instances. And obviously we're going to talk tonight about this man by the name of Joseph. And I want to talk to us tonight about some lessons from a carpenter. Some lessons from a carpenter. Let's pray one more time, if you would, and we'll go to the Lord more to prayer, and then I'll try to preach what the Lord's placed on our heart. Brother Terry, take us one prayer, if you would. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You can be seated. Uh, a lot of times that, uh, you know, a carpenter is a, is a trade. Okay, just if you haven't figured that out yet, it, it is a trade. It is, it is something that oftentimes is a skill that's learned, that's passed down from generation to generation, particularly back in this day. If you had a, a family that was carpenter, usually a son was raised up to take over the family business and to become, uh, to become part of that trade or skilled in that trade. But, but a carpenter sometimes, or, or anybody of a trade really, um, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of ironic. Now, you got to understand where I'm coming from. That's, that's more of my world. Uh, knowing a trade and working a trade and, and knowing what it's like to dig some ditches and some, to do some framing and some wiring and all, that's... that's those are my kind of people, just so you'll know. And uh, most of you already know that. But, you know, when you get around certain aspects of society, it's almost like they look down upon that crowd of people. And I'm not trying to be mean or ugly or trying to be a pity party, but it's, that's just the way it is. Now, the ironic thing is, is they couldn't have anything they have were it not for people that know how to build it, know how to frame it, know how to wire it, know how to plumb it, know how to all these all of these things that they look as menial tasks, they wouldn't have any of that without normal people. Okay, now it's from this mindset. Now, now but by the way, I will say some of the smartest people that I know are tradesmen. I mean that. I mean they they got they got business sense. I, I've met some tradesmen that, that are literally, if I was to name some of the smartest people that I know, they'd be on that list. They have, they have taken nothing and they built 
you don't want to use the word empire, but you understand what I'm saying. They built a very good living. They have built a very good retirement. They have established a business. Uh, they've just got a mind for it. And so all of these things, uh, but, but, they're, but they're, they're men of wisdom. They're ladies of wisdom that, that they have learned some things. And, uh, and it's kind of unique because a lot of what they learn, they learn by watching and they learn by experiencing. You know, they'll try something and fail and learn from it. Uh, they'll watch someone else try fail and they'll learn from that so that they don't go through that. But, they're, but what I'm trying to say is this. They're, 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 they're wiser than what the world gives them credit to be. But when you come to this crowd of people and understand in the setting, now in, in a worldwide setting, in a worldly setting, we would say, okay, uh, that's, an unfair, that's an unfair analogy because uh, depending on what you're doing depends on your skill level or what you would define wisdom, you know, just because a guy can program a computer, if, if they need him to sit down and frame a house, he's lost. And you'd say he's very ignorant on that subject. But you've got a picture. Jesus is now in the, in the synagogue teaching the scriptures. And he hadn't, had a, he hadn't had a formal Bible college. He hadn't been brought up. Now, he's the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He had an advantage on him, okay? But they didn't know that, and they refused to believe that. And so as Jesus is there talking and they're just enamored with where did this guy get his knowledge? And, and here's what they said. I know that he didn't get it from his daddy. Now, we understand that Joseph was, the, was his earthly father. He is the son of God, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to negate his deity. What I want you to see is the way they viewed him, he was the son of Joseph. Okay, that's why we read those scriptures. And so they looked at it and said, well, he didn't get that from his dad. However, there are some lessons that I believe that we can learn from this man by the name of Joseph. I do believe that Joseph was able to have a positive influence on the very life of Jesus Christ. You understand that Jesus took upon himself a form of a servant. And Jesus allowed himself to have a need to learn and to grow, the Bible says that he increased in knowledge and in learning and stature before men. You say, what happened? Jesus allowed himself to be human. And God put him in a household under the, 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 the teaching of a man by the name of Joseph. By the way, at one place in, in reference to this, they acknowledged Jesus as a carpenter which tells me that he had learned a trade from his earthly father, which was being a carpenter. And so Jesus learned some things from him. But if Jesus can learn some things from him, surely we can learn some things from him. Now, I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 1. Uh, and I, I want to look at this man that we'll, we'll basically tonight, uh, as we look at a carpenter, you know, that would be in comparison to that of a Pharisee, that of, of, a, of a tax collector or someone that's very higher up in society, we would look and say Joseph was probably a pretty simple guy. I mean, he was an ordinary, he was your average Joseph. You, you can write me bad letters for that later. I mean, he was just an average guy. He was a simple guy. In fact, G. Campbell Morgan described Mary and Joseph as this, simple village folks with a royal lineage. Uh, that's a great description, by the way. If you read down through, uh, I believe it's Matthew chapter number 1, and I believe it's, it's Luke 4, and you read down through their lineages, the lineage of Christ, uh, I'm going to tell you, they had royal blood uh, that, that, came, that came through them, but by the time it got to them, they were just ordinary, normal people. They wouldn't have stood out in the marketplace. Though they'd come from the lineage of David, as they walked down the, through the streets, no one would have regarded them like they would have if King David would have went down the streets. They were, they were normal, get lost in the crowd. Nobody will really ever know their name apart from this. Just normal people. G. Campbell Morgan goes on to describe it this way. He identified them as this, uh, if, I can, if I can find it where I wrote it down. Uh, he writes this, it's a touch of God on a simple life. Now, that, that stood out when I was reading over this text and reading over a few things. That phrase stood out to me because what better thing could be said about us than to just have a touch of God on a simple life. Normal people that live life 
knowing that God has touched their life and living in such a fashion to have the touch of God and the hand of God on them as they go through their life. Could there be anything really more valuable to someone who professes to know Christ than to know that God's hand is on them as they move from place to place, city to city, trial to trial, from what they face from the heartaches and from the victories and from the defeats, to know that all through that, that the hand of God is on their life when they go. That, that's a pretty significant um, accomplishment, if you will. And so I want us to look about this simple carpenter, this simple man, and some things that we can learn, some lessons that we can learn about this simple man who literally lived his life with the touch of God on him. All right, now, so let, let's look at it. First of all, I want you to see Joseph's description. Joseph's description. Now, uh, just, a few, just a few months back, I preached the series on I Want What They Have. Many of you probably remember that, and we talked about Joseph in that series. And so I went back and I pulled that message out and I looked at a few things and not really preaching the same things. It, it, it may, something that I said may have, I'm sure no doubt I hit some of these things because it's an important portion of the character of, of Joseph. But we're talking about Joseph and, and his, his uncanny ability just to follow the Lord. It's amazing that Joseph was told some very difficult things and Joseph just went and followed God. All right, and I think it speaks to the character as the Bible describes Joseph. And so I want us to look at this Bible carriage for just a minute a little bit closer because, you know, we really don't know a whole lot about Joseph. I mean, there's not a lot of Scripture that's given about, about this man. There's not a lot of test. In, in fact, uh, more than likely it would appear that Joseph was probably, was probably dead by the time Jesus began or very early in the earthly ministry of Jesus. You say, how do you know that? He's not mentioned. You don't find him mentioned as Jesus is doing the miracles. You find Mary... You find Mary was there, but you find no indication that Joseph was there. You find Mary all the way up to Calvary, but you don't find Joseph. And so something happened to this man by the name of Joseph. We don't know what that is. History can probably go back and they can probably make some speculations. But in reality, we know very little other than these really first few chapters that we have in the Gospels about this man by the name of Joseph. But what we do know is pretty profound. All right, so let's look at a few things uh, about how would we describe or how does the Bible describe Joseph. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about a simple, ordinary guy and some lessons that we can learn as simple, ordinary people. What can we learn from Joseph? First of all, I believe that Joseph was an honorable man. He was an honorable man. You know, that's something that's almost lost its significance in our society today is that of honor. That of character, that of, that of something that's, that speaks well of the very nature of who this guy is as an individual. I believe that Joseph was an honorable man. Now I'm going to give you the scripture why I believe that and why I believe the Bible teaches that here in just a minute. But you know, we live in a day to where, you know, men are looked down upon for, for being men. Uh, we, we can't, I don't mean this wrong, we can't win. If we don't hold a door open for a lady... We're, we're terrible, and if we do, we're terrible for that. Say, why? Well, because you're trying to, to take a woman's power away. No, I'm just trying to hold the door open for you. Relax a little bit. I, you know, I didn't really want to hold it up for you, and I don't really want to hold it up for your husband and won't tell me thank you. His sorry self ought to be holding the door in, in the first place. But, I mean, really, you think about it, you, you know, and it's almost like uh, how, 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 men, how men treat their wives. Honor. Man, that, that's a dying thing today. Watch secular television. Watch what they call humor. And it's always a husband and wife, and they're berating each other, and they're cutting each other down, and, and you always see them with these, you know, extramarital relationships, and you all see all, and that's depicted as normal. Let me tell you, that's not normal. All right, and I believe that Joseph was an honorable man. Now I'm going to take a side. I'm going to take a side note here. Okay, we got some teenagers in here. I want you to listen to this. There's nothing wrong with maintaining your purity until you're married. As a matter of fact, that is honorable to be able to do that. Now I am keenly aware of the day and hour in which we live in, and I know that that is an unpopular message in society, but it's still a necessary message to be preached. There's nothing wrong for you wanting your children to be pure when they say their wedding vows. Right. Raise them after that fashion. You say, well, preacher, I messed up. That'll make me a hypocrite. No, that'll make you somebody that's learned from your mistakes and don't want to raise your children to make the same mistakes you did. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. 
There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I was wrong in this area. I failed in this area. As a matter of fact, we do well to do that rather than try to cover it up and sweep it under the rug. Now, that's, i got to move. That's not what I'm preaching on. But Joseph was an honorable man. How do you know that? Look back in Matthew chapter number 1. In verse number, right, in verse number 18, where the, the story of Christmas really takes, takes form and shape. The Bible said, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother, Mary, was a spouse to Joseph, that means they were engaged. Now, those that's ever heard this message understand that espousement back then was, was a big deal. You know, it wasn't like in the South where some person, you know, you've been engaged 22 times and ain't pulled the trigger yet. You know, you, you swap rings and give them back and give them back and trade it and all that. It wasn't like that. I mean, you know, they, they, they was but a step of being married. They carried themselves to a certain degree of responsibility as being uh, spoken for as being taken, okay? And so that was the view of that. So, But he was espoused. She was espoused to Joseph. Notice this. What's it say? Before they came together. Now listen, we're old enough in here to understand Scripture and mature enough to be able to handle this. It means that they had a pure relationship that had not been tainted with any sexual impurities. Now, why would you say he's an honorable man? Because Joseph did not take advantage of this young lady. He wasn't high pressure, it wasn't something he was trying to get her to sneak behind, the, behind her daddy's back and trying to sneak her out the window and trying to pick her up and bring her home late. He wasn't any of that. Joseph was an honorable man. You say, what can we learn from that? I can tell you, we can learn that it's still okay for simple, ordinary people to carry themselves with some dignity and some honor and be the type of people that God has intended for us to be. That's exactly right. Joseph was an honorable man. What else can I learn from Joseph? I believe he was also a just man, the Bible says. Just, but that means he handled himself properly in a, in a righteous fashion. It doesn't mean that he was self-righteous. It doesn't mean that he had, uh, he had a, a, a filled with religiousness and that, an empty religion, but he was a just man. If they look, he handled and conducted his business the way that it ought to be conducted. He, I believe he was a man of his word. I believe he was a man that that. that that kept his commitments. I believe he was a just, he was a man that as he had a testimony in the community, he was a man that dealt right with one another, with, with other people. All right, so he was a just man. All right, I, I believe this, I believe he was a caring man. I, I, had, I had lunch with two preachers, and I won't call their names because both of them get mad at me. But I had lunch with two preachers on Tuesday. And we were sitting there eating, and we got ready, and they're, they're friends, and so when I say preachers, you know, they're, they're just... They were just friends of mine. And we'd, got, we'd finished eating and we got outside and, and somehow or another, Hallmark got brought up. Now, I got a bad rap. I'm just going to tell you, I got a bad rap, Brother Terry, from this Hallmark deal. I had a preacher call one night and this was back, was this COVID or pre-COVID? Pre-COVID, we got home from church on a Sunday or something and this preacher called me about a football game. And I was just about to hear with football and I, I wasn't even watching the football game. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting here in a pair of fuzzy pajamas watching a Hallmark Christmas movie with my wife. Uh, he sent me a package, said he was going to take my man card and sent me boxing gloves and uh, a bluegrass, uh, a bluegrass uh, CD and books on war and I think it was a John Wayne book. And I, I don't know anyway. So I, I caught grief over that, but everything was good in my relationship and I don't, have to, I don't have to go home with him, so I didn't care. And so we were having lunch and this particular preacher happened to be there and long story short, we were both, we got, Hallmark got brought up somehow. And he told me when he got COVID that he was, he got emotional when he got COVID. He said, I got sick. And he said, we were in a cabin. We we're on vacation. He said, my whole crowd got it. He said, and I was laying in a bed, sick as a dog, watching a Hallmark movie. He said, and I looked at, and my wife looked over at me and he said, something happened. And he said, I was just bawling. His wife fell out of bed laughing at him for crying at a Hallmark movie. And I told him it served him right, and I'd send him his stuff back. <laughs> but when you, when you look at, at, at that, now that's way extreme, okay? But let me tell you this. I believe that Joseph was a man that genuinely cared for this young lady. I believe he had a heart. For, I, I believe he loved her. There's no way for Joseph to remain in the relationship that he did there's no way for Joseph to handle himself even before the angel spoke to him had Joseph not loved her. Joseph was a, man, was a caring man. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with people having a heart for other people. 
There's nothing wrong. We can learn a great lesson for us that, that sometimes it would do us well just to be kind. It would do us well to, to be considerate. It, it would do us well and we can learn a lesson to say, hey, if I'm really going to make an influence and an impact in people, it's not always about me being right, but it's how I conduct myself in that process. And Joseph cared about her. You say, well, how do you know that? Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily. Now, you, most of you know the, 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 this accusation, her being with child out of wedlock, he could have had her stoned publicly. He could have humiliated her and by law could have drugged her to, the, to outside of the town. They could have stoned her. He could have went back home righteous in the sight of men. He had the right. To, you say, well, why didn't he? Because he loved her. Now, listen, he was trying to figure out, okay, I'm going to put her away. Uh, basically, I'm going to have a pre-divorce divorce. Okay, I'm going to put, we're not married yet, but I'm committed to her. And the, the, everybody knows I'm committed to her, but I can't marry her in an impure fashion. However, I don't want her to have to bear this reproach for the rest of her life or even to lose her life. Can I tell you what that is? That's compassion. That's the man that loved his soon-to-be wife. And so you find that he was a caring man. He didn't want to disgrace her publicly nor to devastate her publicly. I also believe that he was a discerning man. He was a discerning man. He was a man that had some, some character and the ability not to be so fly by the seat of his pants and no, not to be so irrational that he makes the wrong move based on emotion rather than on the fact and on the leadership of the Spirit of God. You say, how do you know that? The Bible said that all this transpired. And then in verse number 20, he says, but while he thought on these things. That word means to revolve. That, that phrase, to, to, what he thought on these things, means to revolve in the mind or to ponder about. He was thinking about what to do. How am I going to handle this situation? How do I need to do it right? I mean, after all, he was a just man, which weighs into how he responded to things. I want to be right with God. I want to be right with her. I want to be right in the community. How do I do this? And so I, I believe that he was a man of discernment. Man, we could learn a lot from that, couldn't we? How to behave ourselves. Then I believe this. I believe he was a faithful man. Now, we're going to go, we're going to get a little deeper here in just a minute. But if you go to Luke chapter number 2, verse number 21, and then down to verse number 41, uh, I want you to see something about faithfulness. He wasn't just faithful at the beginning of this relationship with Mary and with Jesus. But he was faithful throughout this relationship with Mary and with Jesus. Luke chapter number 4, or Luke chapter number 2, rather, I'm sorry. And I'm just going to read two verses to you. You can read them with me. You'll probably be there before I am. Luke chapter number 2, look it down in verse number 21. The Bible said, and when, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named to the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to, G, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. What's he doing? He is keeping the law and he is bringing his family into obedience of that which was right in the sight of God that they were to do. Did you catch what I just said? He was leading his family in living for God in accordance to what they knew to be right. There was no gray area in this matter. This was a matter, this was down in the law. This is what God said, hey, do this. This is what's to be. You have a man child, you have a boy, this is the type of sacrifice. You have a daughter, there was a different type of sacrifice for that or different days and all that. And he said, so do this. And Joseph led his family in that. But it doesn't stop there. Because if you drop, drop down to verse number 41, the Bible teaches us this, talking about Jesus. Now his parents, who was that? That was Mary and Joseph. Went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. What were they doing? They were keeping the law. They were, they were, they were, every year this feast, everyone would come back to Jerusalem for this feast regardless of where they came from. And so every year they came back. What were they simply doing? They were just doing what they knew they were supposed to do. I'm going to tell you, common ordinary people can learn a lot from Joseph and just we just need to do what we know that God wants us to do and be faithful in doing those things, keep it, uh, the way that God would have to do. So what I can take away from this is that uh, none of these things that we've read are too far-fetched for ordinary people to accomplish. 
You know, I'm not, I'm not reading them. Now, listen, I believe Joseph was a great man. I believe Joseph was used of God. I believe, I believe Joseph had a special place in the plan of God. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But so many times we prop the Apostle Paul up here and we almost like put him on a place that we can't live the way he lived, which is not true. We have the same Holy Ghost, if you're saved living in us, that he had living within him. But we put him up almost like he is the spiritual giant that ordinary people can't attain to that. Well, I'm telling you something that the world viewed as an ordinary man, this man by the name of Joseph, he lived these very things that we're talking about. And if he can live these things through the influence of the Spirit of God, who, by the way, wasn't even indwelt by the Spirit of God because that hadn't happened yet, hello, then surely those of us who have been saved and are indwelt by the Spirit of God can attain to this example that Joseph gave. All right, number two. Look at Joseph's direction. Joseph's direction. The fact of the matter is, is God can direct the lives of his children regardless of the circumstance around them. Now you're going to notice in the lives of these simple people, man, God is, God is directing. Specifically Joseph. Now you say, well, why is that important? Because, because Joseph was the leader of the home. Don't miss that. Don't, don't take away from the significance that Joseph was just kind of a third wheel. God had a plan for Joseph. God had a place for Joseph. Joseph wasn't selected uh, just because, well, he just happened to be the guy that, that Mary was interested in. Oh, no, God put that together. You can tell that from his lineage. Even his lineage was significant in Christ being the one who rightfully sits on the throne of the king of David, on the throne of David in, in, during the millennial reign. It, Joseph was significant in that. And so when you come to this man, I want you to understand that God had a plan and God directed Joseph's life. And the way God directed Joseph's life and the way Joseph responded to God's direction played a pivotal role in the outcome of his family. Fellas, put that in your brain and write that down in your head. How I allow and respond to the directing that God gives me plays a direct role and impact on the rest of my family that I am to be leading. And so Joseph teaches us a lesson about that. Now, you're going to look at Joseph speaks to, or God speaks to Joseph in dreams. Now, let me take a time out. Don't let that, don't let that mess with you, okay? Don't, don't let that, and, and don't go to bed tonight and have a dream and feel like, well, God's speaking to me. No, you probably ate too late, and you shouldn't eat that stuff that late at night, and you have nightmares. Uh, God doesn't work that way. We have the complete word of God. I don't have to operate, God won't out, God's not going to operate outside the realm of his completed word. What did he say in 1 Peter? He said we have a much more sure word of prophecy. It trumps any kind of emotion. It trumps, now I'm grateful for emotion. Man, I'm glad that God still can stir our heart and God uses our emotion. Uh, but our emotion, if we're not careful, can lead us contrary to the pages of the word of God. We can trust emotion when emotion leads us in the same direction as the book does. Now, why is all that important? Because I don't want you to get caught up on this, I don't want to say spiritism, but on this, the big push that we have now that is so emotion driven and negates what the word of God says. The word of God overtakes what you feel, think, or how you believe something ought to be. The scriptures are our source and our final, are our final authority. But they didn't have the complete word of God. It was being written, okay? And so God, which is, it's not... Yeah, you know, I thought about this. Uh, you know, God worked in dreams to more than one Joseph. You remember Joseph in the Old Testament was a dreamer. God got Joseph in a lot of trouble because he was a dreamer. This Joseph, God worked in his life with dreams, but this one kept him out of a lot of trouble. And so God was working or God was, was dealing with dreams, but understand this, God was speaking to him in those occasions. How does God speak to us today, church? He speaks to us through his word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you, talking about the spirit of God, into all truth. And so he's going to guide you with and through and by his word. That's how God speaks to us today. So I wanted to give you that disclaimer. All right, so God is directing this man by the name of Joseph. And I'm glad that God still takes his word and directs his children. I'm thankful that God is invested in you. Simple, ordinary people like us, God still directs. You know why? Because it's important where you lead your family. It's important. 
we have we have parents in here tonight that, that from from all from all, that, that range from all from all different ages. Some some of you that are here have children my age. Some of us my age have children that are that are out of the house. Some on down. I mean, so there's all kind of represented all the way down to just little bitty. Can I tell you something? God's interested in the in the outcome, the where your family winds up, and how your family. Say, so, well, how does how does God going to get us to point A to point B? God's going to direct you to do that. And I can learn that I can trust Him because Joseph trusted Him, and it worked out well for Joseph. All right, now, first of all, let me give you this. He had direction for an unexpected turn in life. You say, well, preacher, you don't understand. I had my life all planned out, and man, all of a sudden, now everything is different, and nothing is what I thought it would be. Welcome to Joseph's world. Welcome to Joseph's world. Do you, th- you really think that Joseph ever planned, ever planned to marry a lady who said she was a virgin but is having a child and he's going to marry her and raise her and raise that child as his own. And then they're going to be taken all over on the run. Their whole re- Do you think Joseph planned for that? You think did Joseph ever sat down in the third grade and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? On the run. I- I'm not trying to be irreverent, but I'm telling you, life took an unexpected turn. Now, it wasn't an unexpected turn for the bad. I can promise you this. I didn't think God would ever in a million years call me to preach. Ever. But when I surrendered to preach, my life took an unexpected turn. For the good, but it was still unexpected. I, I, I never planned on that. I never, I never even, I, I hate to say that, I never even considered it. I, I wasn't looking for it. You say, why? I, I, man, I, I, wanted, I had my own dreams and visions. I'd have messed up my, my, my world and my family, and I'm glad God knows what he's doing. But I'm telling you, God can lead you even when life takes a turn of direction that you don't think it's going to take. Now, I, I, I look at this and I look at some things that we can learn from him because I, I know that he never thought life would ever take this course. I know he never thought that his life would take the course. Probably if you're honest, if you're in this room, probably if you're over 30 years of age, you can probably say my life has taken me places that I never thought that it would ever take me. I, I have faced things that I didn't think I have. Uh, I, I've been able to accomplish some things that I didn't think I would ever be able to accomplish. I've been able to enjoy some things. You say, why is that? That's just the nature of life, isn't it? But how many people, man, they're they're just beside themselves when life takes an unexpected course like, what am I going to do now? Let me tell you what you're going to do now. Just learn to trust God that he can direct you even when life takes an unexpected course. Even when God's doing some things and even when you think, man, I, I never dreamed that I'd be in church, let alone active in church. How am I going to? Listen, God can direct you. And thank God that he can. God's got a plan for your life. All right, we ought to be quick to, quick to learn from Joseph that God can direct our lives through this unexpected, by the way, not to God, but to us. That's a, that's a key element in this. Joseph's unexpected turn in life wasn't unexpected to God. God knew exactly what he was doing. God knew exactly how he was steering and what he was working and where he was leading. God knew exactly. Joseph just had to trust him. And so we'd be, learn, we'd be quick to learn from that. He can direct us and lead our life when it takes a different course than what we had anticipated. By the way, isn't it also worth mentioning that God had a much better plan for Joseph's life than the simple life that Joseph had planned? Think about it. I, I, you can almost picture Joseph's ambition. He just, wanted to, he just wanted to grow his business. He was a carpenter. By the way, when you're in a trade, you want to grow your business. You know why? That's how you pay your bills. That's how you put food on the table. That's how you provide for your family. And I can see as Joseph, maybe learning from his dad or maybe learning as an apprentice somewhere and, and Joseph could begin to get dreams and visions. Don't think the Bible characters are different than us. Don't get in your mind that, man, human ambition takes over. Man, we can see a dream and we want to build this and if I do this and I make the right business deals and get with the right contacts, man, man, this thing could take off the ground and before long, it'd be me and Jesus, we'll be building cabinets and we'll be installing. And, and again, I'm not trying to be irreverent, but I'm just telling you, Joseph was a man. Joseph thought like a man. And, and man's limitations, man, we're limited. And when God looks at us and God says, okay, that's your dream, that's good. But I've got something much bigger for you. If Joseph would have had his way in his simple plans, you wouldn't even know his name today. But in God's plans, 
His name has been recorded in the eternal word of God. That generation after generation after generation. And if Jesus tarries, he's coming. Generations long since I'll stop preaching and be in the grave will still know the name of Jesus. Why? Because God had a bigger plan than he did. And God's got a plan for your life. Trust him in that. All right, number two, what about direction not only for unexpected turns in life, what about direction when we're in uncharted territory? Now, this is where it gets interesting for me or neat for me that I like, that I enjoyed it. God's going to lead Joseph and take care of his family as they were on this journey. Okay, so how many times do we get in our minds that, okay, I'm going to make a decision for Christ and everything else is just going to unfold. And it's not long before that decision we made leads to another decision and another decision and another direction and another place. And all of these places, we didn't see that when we first made that first decision. I can prove it to you. Those of you that, are, that enjoy salvation nights, you're saved by the grace of God. You know what, what happened the night you got saved or the day you got saved? You just didn't want to go to hell. You wanted to be born again. You wanted to receive the free gift of salvation and put faith in Jesus Christ. But listen, you wasn't thinking about 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. You probably, if you got saved before you had children, you probably wasn't thinking the significance and how I am going to raise my children. You just know I'm getting saved. Man, God changed my life. That's great. But then as you go through life and this door opens and this door closes and this presents itself and here, you know what you got to learn to do? Depend on God for every leg of that journey. Right? That's how we do it. Depend on God for every leg of the journey. That's no different than how God led Joseph. Joseph, these, these dreams. I wrote this down. God directed them as they walked the course. He didn't give them the whole plan and the whole map at once. Those of you that use uh, any, kind of, any kind of app, uh, we, we came down the road Monday, we were coming home, and Libby looked over in this guy's car beside us, and he had two GPSs on. I ain't really figured out. I mean, I know that I'm, I have no sense of direction, but apparently this old boy was in a bind. I mean, he had, had his phone and had another GPS, and I, I, don't know, I don't even know. Maybe he had one GPS to remind him where to look for the other. I don't know. But I, God doesn't, you know, but you can take that thing and you can look at it. You can, you can pull it all in and get the whole route in front of you, or you can blow it back up to where you're just on the road. You're at. Listen, God doesn't give, doesn't give us that option to where we get to see the whole route. But what he does, it gives us enough light to get from point A to point B. And that's exactly what he did for Joseph. Now, don't, don't lose sight of this right here. You do understand that Joseph was responsible for his son. Not Joseph's son, God's son. God had entrusted Joseph as a little baby. Don't overthink it. Listen, you, you don't think that Joseph worried about his family? As a man, you don't think when Joseph went to town, he, he got and protected Mary and that new baby from the shady side of town, from sketchy looking people? You don't think Joseph ever feared and had to put them behind him because they was going through a road? I'm telling you, Joseph was a man. And, and yet, with such precious cargo, God didn't say, now Joseph, listen, you're, you're special here, Joseph, and here's what I'm going to do for you that I won't do for anybody else. I'm going to let you see the whole plan unfold so that you'll know how to make better decisions. No, he said, Joseph, you're going to have to trust me from here to here to here to here, just like he does every other simple, ordinary man, to trust God from here to here to here. Now, so when you, when you get back to here, Joseph, uh, God's directed him in uncharted territory. All right, you look at Joseph's dreams, right? Dream number one, first dream. What's he say? Joseph, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Now, before you get any further, before you put your super spiritual thinking caps on, you understand that at this point in time, Joseph had to be devastated. You understand that? Joseph had just found out that the woman that he is supposed to marry, that he is betrothed to, Joseph found out that that woman, that maybe he'd already paid the dowry, maybe he'd already talked to her, I'm sure he'd already talked to her daddy and all that. Joseph, man, he had his life planned out. And she comes and he finds out that she's with child. You don't think he's devastated? You don't think he's crushed? You don't think he's hurt? You don't think he feels betrayed? Now, this is pre-angel, okay? He gets the news, angel hadn't come yet, dream hadn't happened, and in that course of time, when he's pondering things, the Bible says, that's, by the way, it shows his character. He don't want to humiliate her, he don't want to embarrass her, he just wants out, and let's go on with life. Joseph's heart was broken. Had to be. Joseph was crushed. 
And yet God comes to him in a dream, sends his angel in a dream, and God comes to him. You know what he deals with? He does not deal with Herod. He doesn't deal with Egypt. He doesn't deal with, uh, with, with anything about the, the, the manger and, and not finding a place in the end. The only thing that God tells him in the first dream is don't be afraid to go ahead and marry that girl. Why? That's all he needed to focus on right then. Joseph probably couldn't handle it anymore. You know, by the way, Joseph, go ahead and marry her because what I'm going to do is you're going to have to go and you're going to, you're, going to, you're going to marry her and then it's going to be rough. You're going to have to go to Jerusalem, pay your taxes, and you ain't going to be able to find a place to sleep and she's going to go into labor. Her water's going to break. And Joseph, you're going to be in a bind for a little while. And then, by the way, after that, Joseph, everybody's going to want to kill you and so you're going to have to go down to Egypt to live. Well, Joseph, then I'm going to bring you out of Egypt, but I ain't going to tell you how long you stay there. And then you're going to have to go, but you can't go back where you came from. You've got to go to a side street, to a side town, because the new king's going to want to kill you. Have a nice night. No, what he did, he said, Joseph, right here where you're at, in this leg of the journey, don't be afraid to marry her. It's going to be okay. And that's all he did. And you know what Joseph did? He married her. He married her. Now, I'm going to tell you, you may not appreciate the value in that, but can I tell you, God knows exactly how to lead us through the significance of each situation. Listen, you may not have all the answers what was going to happen on down the road, but just get the first fear not to take it and be married. That was the first hurdle that Joseph had to overcome. The first hurdle. And I'm going to tell you, but had he not got over this hurdle, he wouldn't have had to worry about Jerusalem or Egypt or Nazareth, or any of them other places. Why? Because he wouldn't have got married. And so he had, to, he had to deal with this, and so he dealt with that in the first dream. Second dream, go to chapter number two. They've had the baby. They've already been, and, and already, man, they've been down in, in the manger, and I mean, there wasn't no room down there, and we had to stay out back, and, and all this, and we, we found us a little place to, to stay till she gets recovered or whatever, and, and we're going to go down to the temple, and we're, we're going to get all that taken care of. But after all that happens, over in chapter number two, you have the account of the wise men, okay? So the wise men come, and they come into the house where, they, where they're at, not the stable, come into the house and, and present the gifts and all of these things. And while the wise men are all that's transpiring, and by the way, I, I have to think in a day about the, the timeline. You know there's a lot going on around the birth of Christ? God's dealing with a lot of people at the same time. I mean, you got shepherds in the field. You got the Magi on the other side of the world. You got Mary and Joseph. He's trying to deal with. You got John the Baptist, Mama Elizabeth, and Zachariah. You got John the Baptist being born six, uh, three months before Jesus got here. You got all of these things going on. You got Herod that's taking over rule. You got all of these that's trying to go back in Scripture. There's a listen. There's a lot of busy stuff happening at Christmas. You think it's busy now? It was busy then, yeah. and all of this stuff is taking place. And God looks down and he said, okay, this is great, man. They're presenting the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is great, man. We're going to love. And God says, by the way, dream number two, you got to get out of town. But, but Lord, wait, we just got settled. Lord, we just rented a little house and, and got a place. And, and I got me a little, little shop out back. And I can do my carpenter work. And God, is, it's going to work out right here. Now, Joseph doesn't say any of that. But you know, human, he's still human. But you know what God does? In a dream, God leads him by his word again. He said, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Egypt, this is uncharted territory. These are not friendly to the people of God. This is not a wonderful place to raise a family. By the way, the Egypt of the world is still not a great place to raise a family. He said, I want you to go to Egypt. By the way, aren't you glad that God can't protect your family even when you live in Egypt? You can just chew on that for a minute. Egypt's the type of the world. And listen, the world, you've got to be careful, you've got to be on guard, but God can preserve your family even when your family has to live and dwell in Egypt. And that's a great thing and a testimony about the God we serve. You know, God knows how to move His children to get them where He wants to be. I thought about this. I thought about how the Lord led Israel through the wilderness. You know why God took them to the wilderness at first? Because the Bible tells us that He knew that they could not handle the wars. He knew that it was a straight shot. If they had went point A to point B, man, they could have been there in just no time. But the problem was is they could not handle the battles that they were going to have to face in order to get there. So God led them through the wilderness to get them to the promised land. God took them to Egypt to get them around Herod to get them back to where Nazareth where they needed to be. God's able to do that for you. We just need to trust him. i got to hurry. The third and fourth dream because they really, they really kind of coincide. What happened? God said, okay, you're in Egypt. Now I want you to come back. 
And on the way back, God then says, oh, wait a minute, don't go all the way back. I need you to go over here because now Herod's son, he's crazy too, and he's going to want to kill you too. And so God sends him a detour. All this is going on. You know what Joseph's having to do? And we, we come a long way around to say that Joseph is having to learn to trust God, not in order to walk, but as he walks. We need to learn that we can trust God, not just to take that first step, but as we take the steps that God leads us to take, we can trust him to take the next step and the next step and the next step and the next step. And you know where we can learn that from? We can learn that from a simple carpenter who trusted God on his journey. Direction for an unexpected, unexpected turn in life, direction for an uncharted territory, and then direction followed shows Joseph's unwavering trust. Now, it's worth noting this, and we'll move to the last thing, and the last one's quick. It tells us that Joseph took God at his word. He believed God and trusted God without arguing. You never find it. Matthew 1, 20, fear not to take to thee, Mary. By the way, Joseph probably knew the scriptures. Joseph probably been taught this is not a far-fetched thing, that Messiah is going to come. This is how he's going to come. All right, so he said, fear not to take unto thee, Mary. Then down to verse 24, then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. God said, don't be afraid to marry her. So you know what he did? He married her. Matthew 2, 13, he said, arise, flee into Egypt. Verse number 14 said, he arose and departed into Egypt. That's obedience. That's just, okay, I know clearly that this is what God wants me to do and I'm going to step forward and do it. Matthew 2 and 20, arise, go into the land of Israel. Matthew 2, 21 says, and he arose and came into the land of Israel. Then as verse number 22 progresses, God says, listen, in another dream, I want you to go to this particular part of Israel and stay here. And so not only does God give him a generic place to go, but then God brings him to a specific point in his life. What I'm saying is this, is he learned to trust God. All right, third of all, and I'm done. Joseph's description, Joseph's direction, Joseph's dependence. And the last point is just a reiteration of what we've already said. What made Joseph, why did Joseph receive direction the way he did? Why? You're not supposed to ask why, right? Y'all, if, you're, if you're right with God, you won't ask why. That's not true. You will. And look up here. It's okay. Now, you, you, that's not questioning God, by the way. That's God, teach me. God, I, I don't understand. God, teach me. God, would you show me? I need, I'm, I'm weak, God. I need you to show me. That's not saying, God, you were wrong in doing what you did. That's not what that is. It's okay to say, God, why? But So what was the, where's the why behind Joseph just obeying? Joseph just obeying. Because he, he did it, I mean, he did it unwavering. If we could obey like Joseph, would that, not be a, would that not be like a huge testimony? Go to Egypt. Okay. I, I can almost imagine coming home and telling Libby, hey, listen, God told me we're moving to West Virginia. It's not going to work out good at my house. I'm going to have to prove that God told me to move to West Virginia. Like writing on the wall, stone tablets, you know, the whole nine. But I mean, he just come home and said, okay, hey, listen, this is great. And man, they've, they've been taking, they've taken this all in as, the, as the, the wise men came and presented gifts. They're just soaking it in. And they're watching everything and, and life's good. Joshua comes home and said, hey, gets up from a nap. We got to go. We got to go. God told, when did he tell you? Just now. I, I don't know that you got that right. And they just packed up and went. They get down in Egypt. Here's the interesting thing. Do you know how long that Joseph knew he was going to be in Egypt? He didn't. The angel said in the dream, I want you to go to Egypt and wait for a word from me before you leave. You know what he said? He said, you just go down there and wait on me. If you don't think that Joseph knew what it was like to, be, to have to wait on God for direction, you need to go back and reread this text. Joseph had to wait in Egypt for God to bring him through. Sound familiar? You ever, you ever been in that, that place in Egypt? You just want to get home. You just want to get out of this place. You just want to get back on track, but yet you're waiting, and, and you know you can't go without God. And so you just wait and you wait. I wonder if Joseph ever went to bed at night hoping that this would be the night he'd get another dream. Hoping that this would be the night that God would speak to him and say, get up. But I'm going to tell you, he had to learn to wait on God. But everything that he did hinged on the authority of what God said. 
Joseph had an unwavering dependence upon the word of God. The angel's instruction, when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. Can I tell you where a good place and a good lesson to us to learn from this carpenter would be this. Be there where God puts us until he brings us word to move. Keep my family raised where God wants me to raise them. Keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Keep being what I'm supposed to be being until I get word from God for me to go someplace else and to do someplace different. We've got a lot of people. You know what they've done? They've, they've done their own thing. They've went their own direction. They've went their own way. And what they've essentially said to God is, God, this is what you said, but God, this is what I'm going to do. Can I tell you what we can learn from a simple carpenter? Just go where God tells you and stay until the word of God moves you. Can I tell you, there's a lot at stake. Can you imagine if Joseph went back early? Let me tell you what happened. Probably he'd have been killed. His family would have been killed. Why? Hair was out to kill him. And what Joseph may have thought, I hate Egypt and I'm sick of being in Egypt. I don't like it here. I don't like their food. I don't like the people. They're hateful. They're grouchy. They hate our people. And I just want to get out of here. However, God knew this is where you need to be at this season in your life. And he waited on the word of the Lord before he left. But man, once he got it, you know what he did? We're out of here. He was gone. And he left. Why? Because he had confidence in the scripture. So what can we learn from Joseph? Well, Joseph's description, he was a a just man. He was an honest man. He was an honorable man. He was a man of compassion. He was a man that cared. He was a man of character. We learned that. from. We can be that kind of just simple, ordinary. It's not far-fetched. We can can live that way too. We can learn from his direction as he allowed God to speak through his word and he responded based in accordance to the word of God. And then we can learn that Joseph was utterly dependent on what God had said. I'll give you this and I'm done. You think Joseph was emotional? You think Joseph had emotion? I believe he did. You think Joseph ever got to the places where where he said, man, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do that. Yeah, he might have gotten his heart of hearts to where he wondered, Lord, really? You really want me to marry her? You know, I, I don't know, you know, if his mind went to, to the book of Hosea. I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to be ugly, to, but I mean, you know, he's, a, he's, he's human. He's a man. And God did him all this, but at the end of the day, he did every single thing God asked. You know why? Because he was utterly dependent upon God's word. When we begin to live our life utterly dependent upon God moving in our life, and God directing us through his word, then I believe that we're at the right place for God to lead us where he wants us to go. Would you stand with me tonight? Miss Carrie's going to come begin to play. I hate to leave tonight without giving you an opportunity just to come around the altar and just just talk to the Lord and say, God, I don't want to get in a hurry. I just want to make sure that you lead my life through your word. When we live our life that fashion, I believe we'll regard his word as more precious. I believe that. When I'm really living in accordance to say, I need the Lord to speak to me, then I believe that we'll regard His Word in higher authority, higher regard better. Maybe tonight you can look back and see how God's hand has been on on your lives in certain situations. Maybe you're here and you say, well, I, I, listen, I know that, preacher, if I'm honest, I know that I've gotten out of what I know God wants for my life. Can I tell you, God's hand is also a hand of mercy that knows how to guide you back to the Father's house. If you're here tonight and you're not where you ought to be with God, I'd like to encourage you to come. I don't know your heart. I don't know what you brought through the back door. I really don't. But I know this, there's a God in heaven that does. He knows exactly where you're at. Exactly you're here tonight and you're not saved you don't know Christ is your Savior they sung about the blood the whole reason he was born of a virgin was that one day he would go to an old rugged cross and die on Calvary for your sin and mine if you don't know Christ is your Savior it would be a great night to do that 